Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to Projections, our show about VR and AR. We are now one week after GDC, where we got mm -hmm. to see a lot of games and hardware. And one of the things that we saw for the first time was the wireless Vive uh, transmission system. We've seen wireless solutions before, but this is the official, the first one that's really an official wireless solution from one of the majors. And it's uh, it's licensed from a company that already existed. Yeah, uh, DisplayLink. So uh, previously we had used TPCast, a wireless company that had adapters for both the Rift and the Vive. And we really like the untethered wireless experience. Who doesn't? Yeah, um, it's a little bit finicky to set up and there's some extra hardware, you have to put a router in. And that is still the same case with the Vive solution in that there's extra hardware. So the way you set it up is that your headset, whether it's a Vive or the new upcoming Vive Pro, uh, you, instead of passing your HDMI signal and your power and your USB signal onto an adapter that gets plugged into your computer, mm -hmm. all of that gets plugged into this receiver transmitter that gets mounted on top of your head and also then a USB battery pack. On the PC side, your outputs uh, then get put onto a transmitter that has an antenna, and you actually plug in a PCI Express card on, on this system um, as opposed to a router on the TPCast system. Right. Um, but we got to play a, a demo for a little bit using this new Vive system and actually chat with some of the DisplayLink developers about their compression algorithm, and so let's check that out. Our background is really enterprise solutions. So if you look at you know all of the docking station solutions that exist in the market, most of those are enabled by DisplayLink. So we're not a new player in this segment. We're not a new player for doing you know multi-display technologies. We looked at VR and said, well, that's two displays. We've got some great technology. Maybe we can actually do something here to make it even better. Cutting the cable, or as we call it, severing the tether, is something everybody's been complaining about, everybody wants to do. So on this mission, what we did was we looked at our tech, we first built a solution we showed at 2017 CES. It was the first time it was ever shown. By the time we got to March, we went to Mobile World. We actually built a dev kit and we said to the world, you know, we could start working on something together. By June of that year, we had actually an announcement with Vive saying, let's get together. It was a partnership with ourselves, with Intel, and with HTC Vive to create the wireless headset. And here we are now, CES was just announced. We're now showing the real product, you know, which is going to come to market probably around summertime. So that's kind of how we've, you know, the background that's, kept, that's got us to where we are today. Well, let's talk about the technology that makes latency-free wireless for VR possible, because the needs for enterprise are different than the needs for VR. It's not just about resolution and throughput. You also need latency, and from the way I understand it, encoding video to be transferred wirelessly, that adds latency to the process. So what is it about your solution that's going to reduce that latency, and what is your, what is your internal targets for how much latency you want to have? So we, we like to call it pixie dust, but in, in actual fact, of course, there's a lot of rocket science that goes behind it. To make this possible is really difficult. You're transmitting a huge amount of data over you know, a finite bandwidth. What we've done is we partnered with Intel on the radio because that they had a technology which made a lot of sense. Why so why gig? Exactly. 60 gigahertz spectrum. You know, a lot of people have looked at Wi-Fi, but you get a lot of interference. You get a lot of other other people operating in the spectrum. It's just really not enough. Why gig made a lot of sense. It's point to point. It's very direct. You know, Wi-Fi is a little bit like a torch. Why gig's a little bit more like a laser pointer. So you know, you can be very direct and accurate with what you're sending. But of course, where anything is wireless. You're moving around, you know, as a headset. You say it's different from enterprise. Absolutely is, you know, because we want to enable people to run around. As you're running around with the headset, those radios, you know, they're connecting, they're maybe disconnecting and bouncing. That changes the bandwidth that's available constantly. So in a real-time spectrum, what we have, what we've brought to this is our codec actually can do dynamic compression and dynamic adjustments in real time. So a lot of compression technologies are kind of binary. They're like a light switch. You turn them on, you turn them off. With DisplayLink, you can think of it as lots and lots of different levels. We can jump in and out at any particular point. We can compress, we can not compress at all. And we can do that dynamically on the fly, subframe, so that as people are moving around and as the bandwidth is adjusting, we're adjusting how we're doing all of the compression 
all the time. Because the last thing you want is either cut out the signal or increase the latency. Those are the things that are fixed and all you're potentially reducing is image quality. Now does your codec then adjust for where in the image gets more, more potentially pixelated or is more compressed um, because we know that users are looking toward the center of the image? So, I mean, you're, you're kind of leaning towards foveated capabilities, um, which we haven't even enabled yet. Mm. Um, so what you're seeing today with the latest Vive, which is what, 70% more pixels than the last Vive, that's without even that turned on. Um, we still have all of that that we can add on top of this. What we're doing today, we have a, it's, it's a very uh, proprietary compression algorithm. We've not taken anything from anybody else. We've built this from scratch. Um, but we look at a lot of different levels. We obviously, we look at you know, color space, we look at what's moving, we look at what's not moving, we look at the, the quality levels. We're just on so many different levels, but the goal to us is to make it absolutely, effectively invisible to the user. We want the best user experience possible. Now, of course, with VR, you know, buffering's not an option. You can't buffer and move around. So all of that's going to be done with as close to zero latency as you can get. Now, what we're working with, you know, we want to give the experience of the same quality that you had when you had the tether. We want to sever the tether, take that away, and leave exactly the same quality. There's some challenges doing that. Um, Ygig is great, but obviously as you transfer, you do have some levels of slight introduced latency. But you know, with the partnership that we've got between ourselves and Intel and HTC for this particular one you're seeing behind us, you know, we've minimized that as much as possible. Well, talk about the, the setup process and what's going to look like when you get this and you attach it to your Vive. Obviously, there's a big transmitter on top of, uh, a receiver, sorry, on top of your head that you're wearing, but it also is bi-directional, right? So what are you installing in your computer? What are you installing in your room to have the most optimal experience? Yeah, absolutely. So take a standard gaming PC. There is a, a PCI Express card. So it's a simple card, adds on, so you open the side, plug in a PCI Express card. On the back of that Express card is a cable antenna connection. What Intel have done, which is fantastic, is they've enabled a two meter connection, so kind of coax connection, which will go up to, a, to an antenna. So up on the wall behind us, there's actually two little black boxes, probably a couple of inches. Um, the Vive one's really cute, it's really small. Um, they've optimized that. But what you'll do then is, is mount that PCI card in the PC, install that, close back up the PC, screw in the cable antenna, and either you could mount that on a wall or you could mount it on a stand. The goal is to obviously have the antenna reasonably high up because you want to get clearest line of sight possible. It's why gig technology. Um, so making that antenna length was a real critical part of the process. We're showing that here today. So we've got PCs behind here. We've got the cables up the wall. We actually got them probably about eight feet up there. Um, so you've got that level of flexibility. But it would be easy to install in a home or in an office. You know, we've got everything from gamers through to car automotive environments where people want to do you know, design, um, mixed designs and have multiple people looking in at new designs to airlines looking at seat spacing. You know, VR is, you can imagine it, it can happen. And then you're also transmitting sound and then you're, are you putting uh, input, your Bluetooth via the controllers and also the camera images, all, that all get passed back to the system via the Everything same way? is going the same way, exactly. So all of your sensor data, all of the camera data, all of the imaging data, all of the audio, everything is going over the link, and obviously you've got to do that where nobody can notice. Um, so it's super critical. One of the benchmarks for us, and we tried this out at CES last year, was to take people and say, you see the controller, juggle the controller. Now, to break that down, what's happening in actual fact is when you move the controller, the sensor data is going to the headset, it's getting transferred wirelessly back to the computer, the computer is rendering where the hand controller is, sending that image back, all of that transfer is happening, and that's going to happen in such a, such a way that your brain's motor cortex moves your hand in a position where you'll be able to catch. Now, throwing something and catching it is one thing. Juggling, that takes it to a whole different level. But to us, you know, we said to people, we welcome people to come and try that. The latency is so low, you can do that, which means when you're playing a game or moving around, you're really not feeling that at all. Now, how does this system scale, both in terms of being future-proof and higher resolution displays coming, and how about how many users can use it in, within the same space? Great question. So, at the moment, what we've got in here is our 8000 chip. So the DL8020 is the chip that's currently driving the, uh, the latest Vive solution. That actually has the capability to be able to go right the way up to 4K. At what frame rate? At the moment, we're 90. We're not talking beyond 90, but believe me, we've got bags of space. Mm -hmm. um, so we're pretty much good in the future-proof 
mode on that. That would be the same chip and just software firmware? Exactly. And that same chip has the ability to drive HDMI or DisplayPort outputs. So if it's different headset interfaces to the panels, we've got that built into the device right from the get-go. In terms of connectivity, you ask in terms of connectivity and how many units, um, that's more on a wide gig side. At the moment, wide gig's broken up into channels. So there's three direct channels that you can have, which directly gives you the ability to have three users. Um, but because it's such a direct technology, in terms of point to point, if you were to orient players in a certain way, you ought to be able to get to a lot more than that. So one of our goals is to you know, keep that moving forward and look at that. I know Intel's looking really closely at that as well. So you know, they'll be more, more able to answer that question than ourselves, but we all know that multiplayer aspects of this and people doing design reviews and things like that for both industry areas, that's certainly going to be a must have. Awesome, well thanks so much for chatting with us Andy and we can't wait to actually get this in our homes and, and have an untethered VR. Absolutely, awesome. great to see you guys, thanks very much. Okay, so uh, we've used TBCast and now we've used a little bit of this Vive wireless transmission <laughs> system. What do you think about the experience? In both cases, in this case specifically, I was highly impressed. I mean, it feels like a wired connection. The thing you're worried about when you do this kind of thing is latency first and foremost, and compression artifacts secondly. That's right. <clears throat> I didn't notice either. Now, wow. now, they said that they have an enormous amount of bandwidth. Like, the headroom that they have available uh, is beyond what they even need right now. Yeah. Right? And, and when I'm playing, and I'm, I'm only feet away from the receiver, but it's a wireless connection, and I feel like it's, uh, like it's wired. I'm spinning my head around, and I'm actually actively looking for latency, and I can't detect it. Where the two uh, game demos we had, one was Sirius Sam, and we're teleporting, we're actually walking around. Their booth area, as you can see in the video, was maybe 15 feet by like 30 feet wide. Yeah. Pr pretty big area. And uh, like, like you, no latency problems, and even when I'm moving my head around really quickly, no compression artifacts. Mm -hmm. Image quality looked basically like a hardwired signal. It did, and, and what's fun is that you have to remind yourself you're not wired. So like most of these games are gonna be designed for uh, you know being wired, <laughs> whatever that means, but you have to remember that you can spin around. And so I, I forced myself to do a 180 spin around, and it was just, a liberating feeling that you do, just don't get in VR. Yeah, and what was interesting in chatting with them about how their system works is that they, they don't, they're not working on the wireless transition. That is Intel, Intel's Ygig system. Yeah. And Ygig is like TPCAS on a 60 gigahertz, um, 60 gigahertz spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, that also has built in data in addition to video. So this is why with the Vive system, you also get your microphone, you get the camera, and you get the USB, you get the, the Bluetooth for the controllers, all sent through the headset back over the same Y gig signal right. to the computer as opposed to having a separate transmitter like on TPCast that gets into a router of them that's also hardwired to your computer. So you would mentioned a 60 gigahertz signal. People know from home Wi-Fi the difference between 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz uh, means higher bandwidth with 5 but shorter range. You can right. go through fewer walls. It turns out with 60 gigahertz you can't even go through a sheet of paper. Right, it, that's why you need that line of sight. And that informs the design of that receiver that you put onto the headset. They have these two antennas that stick out. And what's interesting is that it, in real time, can test the strength of the signal from the transmitter you have, whether it's mounted to the top of your room or plugged into your, your computer, mm -hmm. to either of those antennas and can switch between right. which one And then the antennas time. can beamform, which is the technology I've seen from routers, uh, where it actually directs the signal back towards the receiver. Yeah, and in the 60 gigahertz spectrum, there's also, like, like with routers, you have channels, right? Mm -hmm. And just like if you set up a home router, you would decide the, uh, a less noisy channel so you don't have interference between other routers, maybe in your neighborhood. It's going to be the same case with this system where there's a limited number of channels, um, but they think with uh, the Y gig, you can actually have up to three users in the same area on a Y gig signal, so this could potentially work for location-based environments by having up to three people with three transmitters and three receivers mm -hmm. and not have those signals cross. Or potentially higher uh, resolution from mm -hmm. future headsets. Right. Um, so, I mean, it just works with the Vive Pro, which is already a higher resolution, but they're not even worried about future-proofing beyond that. Yeah, they think 60 gigahertz and Y gig has a lot of headroom in, in that wireless transmission system to go up to you know, 4K at 90 hertz. Now the other part of the technology, and it's the part that DisplayLink develops, is the video compression. Yeah. And it's really interesting to learn how they uh, adjust video compression and why video compression in the past has not been optimal 
for something like VR, where you need low latency and high refresh rates. I mean, you're talking about an encoding process and a decoding process, I and mean, that yeah. takes time, and you have no time, and you're talking about motions to photons, and you want low, low latency. And so they're telling us that with their system, which is not even perfectly optimized, there's mm -hmm. still headroom to optimize there, they are uh, analyzing the signal and encoding um, and, and, uh, their frames at like 10 times a second. Well, not only that, <laughs> while a frame is being encoded, it is also being decoded. That's like, why it's, yeah. In the middle of an encode pass, the receiver is already receiving it and decoding it. So think about that, right? Like Per second. Our, our VR headsets on the desktop site, 90, 90 frames a second yeah. as a baseline. Right. So they're pinging, they're, they're checking the quality of that, that transmission mm -hmm. at 900 times a second. And mid-frame, if they feel like you're not getting a perfect line of sight or you walk too far away, they can adjust the compression quality right. and ch adjust that so it's lower bit rate right. and then decode that. And they're doing it in a way where we're not noticing. No, well, we were in a good scenario. I mean, I'm not sure we even saw much degradation we at all. We were walking away, 30 right. feet away from, from that. But supposedly, if you, if you did, th th what that means is you don't drop frames. Like, you might get part of a frame that's high res and part that looks yeah. low res, but at least you're keeping your frames, which keeps you from throwing up when you're in VR. And they said, from their testing, it's really two drop frames is that's when you notice the it. benchmark when you notice it. And so as long as they can develop their technology where they can have maybe have one bad frame or half a bad frame, right. but you never drop more than two frames, mm -hmm. then it's going to feel seamless to the end user. They did say that it was a proprietary um, en encoder decoder. However, they, they mentioned that it was a grid based. So that, that yeah. reminds me of like a JPEG kind of thing where it can get, uh, you know, basically low resolution and the more you refine it, the higher resolution it gets. Grid based line by line encoding. Right. Whereas when I asked them, have they even thought, uh, thought about foveated encoding, it is something that they are thinking about where they can degrade the image quality from the outside of the frame and so uh, that's part of, part of your periphery where you may not even notice um, that type of signal degradation. Yeah, I was geeking out about it. Um, it's very compelling. Um, do we know the price yet? No price. They, they're hoping you know, this year sometime uh, and it's really up to HCC. Now knowing HCC will set, you know, it's their device ID, um, DisplayLink isn't going to make their own transmission system and sell it as a third party. They've just licensed this out. HCC will decide that price and my expectation is that it's going to be high. <laughs> yeah, well, mine would be too, especially after the HTC Vive Pro announcement yep. coming out at uh, $800. Right. So, you know, whether or not it's worth it to you, it's a matter of how much you're investing in VR, um, and we'll see what, it's, what it costs. I'm, I will tell you that the feeling of wireless is nothing short of liberating. Yeah, and it really feels like this is where VR, desktop VR, shouldn't be moving toward yeah. in the future. And it gets into that, like, competitive gaming, if there are competitive, and there are competitive VR gamers, you know, as there are in standard PC games, there's really high-end expensive components. This is the kind of thing that will give you an edge if you are that kind of a gamer. We'll be definitely testing it when it comes out. We did also see a bunch of games at GDC and some tech demos. Uh, one tech demo is from Stress Level Zero. They're ah. developers behind Hover Junkers and Duck Season. And while they didn't have a real full game to show off here, that might come at E3, they did have uh, some technology that's going to be the underlying basis for a lot of their games going forward. I feel like it's an evolution of what they've done so far. They've done shooting games with Hover Junkers and then again with uh, Duck Season. Duck season, they really embraced that two-handed uh, uh, shotgun, right? And that was novel because you, the aiming mechanic is different. If you have, you know, if you one arming it, it's not as accurate as if you have two. And the aiming process of using two hands is novel and immersing to a degree. And there's the cocking that you have to do, and they've expanded that. There's now they want to use that two-handed solution. I think across more weapons. And it really, uh, the demo they had us jump in, it was just like a test space where you had yeah. uh, virtual guns from pistols to assault rifles on a table. And they wanted to really show that you can do like scopes, virtual scopes mm. in, in VR with an assault rifle. What, what, if you haven't played Duck Season, what they do is when you hold a two-handed weapon, the game knows that your intention is that you're holding a two, you should be s steadier. Now your hands might not actually be really steady in the real world because there's no brace right. between the two controllers, and you don't necessarily have a stock that actually pushes against your shoulder. What you would, how you would steady a rifle in real life. So the game compensates for that by then making your movements less match up to what the and um, uh, to the virtual controller and give you a little bit of leeway on where your hands are moving and still then steady 
your virtual assault rifles so right. you can look down the sight. Right. They've incorporated a uh, detection so that you can put the holster, not the holster, but the, the, stock. the stock right here and, you know, steady yourself and get a steadier shot. Um, the thing is, there's always going to be this uh, fantasy when you're holding a two-handed weapon about actually feeling that. Like, yeah. I can push the gun through my body if I'm right. holding a two-handed weapon, or I can move my hands t uh, together and, and further apart, and it doesn't match up in VR. To me, it's, it's, it's not the same as holding, you know, essentially like the PSAIM or something like that that is a real-world piece of, uh, you know, it can be PVC for all mm -hmm. I care in the real world, but as long as it's represented in VR, at least to scale, then it's it, a stopgap solution. It, feel, it is a stopgap solution. You're right. And you're saying that you would rather have a developer not have the two-handed weapon focus on what they're good at, no. maybe just the pistol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly, I do think the pistols are more immersing for that reason, because it, it, it is, mm -hmm. it you completes are holding the picture. One one. Exactly. Um, however, you know, there's something to be said for the mechanic that, that we experienced in, in Duck Season. I just feel like it's not an immersing thing. It's more of a mechanic, and uh, you know, that's just something to consider. And one of the other mechanics they showed off in their Bone Works demo was bullet time, slowing down time. Uh, in VR. Now, uh, we've done bullet time games like Super Hot, for mm -hmm. example. In Super Hot, while the enemies are moving slow, you as a character still have one to one movement. Right. Because we always think if you break that one to one movement, it's going to feel nauseating. Yes. You're, you're going to be, uh, you're going to experience discomfort. In their Bone Works demo, though, they're actually slowing you down as well. Um, and so you're disconnecting your virtual hand between mm -hmm. your real hand. And there is a little bit of lag. That, they did something clever, though, that I haven't seen before. And it, they want you to also be in bullet time and to encourage you to slow the real world you down and be in bullet time. If you sync up with what is bullet time in the game, you actually move a little bit faster. Ah. So if you outpace the, the VR space, it's a, they, they penalize you. Right. They gamify the right. bullet time movement. Yeah. Um, which I, I like, like you can technically move and disassociate yourself from your virtual character, but if you're swinging your hand and they have, uh, they can project forward, they know that you're, you're anticipating you to swing your hand up, all you gotta do is move at a constant rate mm -hmm. and then you can basically play bullet time. Yep, and all of the bullets are actual projectiles, you just can't see them unless you're in bullet time. Mm -hmm. A really cool tech demo and we'll hopefully be seeing more of what their actual games uh, using this, mm -hmm. uh, maybe at some like E3. Yep. Uh, one other game that we saw that did have support for uh, a physical hand prop was Arizona Sunshine. Yeah, new update to the single player campaign, um, also going to be uh, playable by two people and they're now supporting this prop. Uh, I don't even know who makes it, but it is a uh, made for the uh, HTC Vive. Vive Puck, and you attach that to the top, and all of these buttons on the device come alive, and there's a, you know, a safety, and there's a, obviously a trigger. What's cool is there's a stock in this thing that when you depress it, it's a, it's a button. It appears to be a button, mm. and the game can then interpret that and know that you've hold, that you've uh, you know braced it, which I think is a cool touch. And and that's what I'm looking for. Like I like being able to hold the real world weapon. I think they went overboard with making it look so realistic. That's completely unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. And something they also did was uh, because they had it look realistic in game, and I was trying to look down the sight. I'm wearing a, a physical headset that protrudes from my face several inches. Right. I was hitting my headset against the weapon the whole time. Right. So it made that actually ineffective. It's, it's where having a pistol in front of you, away from your headset actually, is easier lighting down the sight. For this prop, I was actually holding it away from me so I can look down the sight, mm -hmm. and it just didn't feel natural. Right, I guess yeah. if you dedicate yourself to a prop like that, you're also dedicating yourself to two-handed weapons. That's right, that's right. And also the way you move around the world, the interaction, as opposed to being able to grab a yep. drawer and pick things up, now you're going back to abstractions and pressing buttons and using thumbsticks. And so you're, these are trade-offs. Right. You know, we're not in that perfect scenario where you can have free form hand tracking and hand presence um, and then still pick up a physical tangible prop. Like, mm -hmm. That's still a ways away. Mm -hmm. um, Another game developer that we stopped by who wasn't showing off a game with guns was Servios. Yes. Yet again, they are, they're innovating again with, when it comes to the interface. I think they're doing really good stuff in VR. Yeah, uh, Servios developers of Raw Data and also uh, Sprint Vector, they had two games they were showing at GDC. Uh, one is a boxing game under the Creed license. You played this one. Yeah, so I, Lionsgate, who uh, is a distributor for the Creed films, is a partner with Servios. So this is not to promote any new Creed film, which I think they, there is one in development, um, but it's a straight up boxing game. That's and, that's good news, actually, yeah, because yeah. all the promotional stuff so far has been kind of, eh. Sure. Um, and it was fun. Um, they did something with this Creed boxing game, which is reminding me of the Boneworks demo. 
also. How so? In that there is some disassociation between yeah. your real hands and also your boxing hands, your okay. avatar. And they intentionally disassociate your real hands and the boxing hands when your character gets tired. It's a way to demonstrate fatigue. Oh, interesting. Uh, when we play a game like uh, Robo Recall, uh -huh. uh, for example, and just always perfect one-to-one -one movements, you know, you're a robot in that game. You have infinite strength, uh -huh. and that works in the real world because you're not actually grabbing onto anything or lifting actually heavy things. So when you're playing a boxing game and you got to demonstrate that you're getting weaker, how do you make your character you? feel weaker because mm -hmm. you're always going to move fast, move right. fast. So are you saying you would move and hit a punch and, and the slow, VR hand would very lag? Very slightly okay. lag behind you to demonstrate sluggishness. But only when you were fatigued? Only when you were fatigued. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then you have to like hold your hands up and then rebuild your stamina before you get more be better one-on-one. Oh, one that's how you build it back. They also mm -hmm. did another thing. I was watching on the monitor, and it looked like when you would get punched or knocked out, yeah. you would get thrown out of the ring like an out-of-body experience. Right, right. And then you would actually have to like sprint vector back yes. into the yeah. into your body. Yeah, so that's a little definitely more arcade-like, but I, I like that it's a, it's a different mechanic because they have to find ways to handicap you right. as a character because otherwise you do have this infinite st uh, stamina and infinite strength. Mm -hmm. The other game that Servius was showing was a music game. Yeah, it's called Electronauts. Um, you know, is it a game? I don't know. It's, it's a music experience, and there are some of these already out there. This, however, it looks, in terms of graphics and in terms of interface, it's polished. Is the idea that you are creating music? Yes. Using this? Yeah, you would imagine that you're like this super DJ, and you're at this console with all of these controls that you have to learn how to use because it, they're completely space age. But you grab these different cubes and you plop them into these consoles that are um, basically, they become whatever the cube wants them to become. Mm. So they're filters for the music, or they are little drum pads that you can play. And the whole game is uh, played with you're holding these phantom drumsticks, essentially. And you use them to grab and to move things around, sort of like a pointer. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you can physically play, and everything is quantized. So of course, it makes you sound good. Uh, if you're, you can set up these loops, and you can, you know, get things playing on its own. And then you can play with these uh, filters, which are these volumetrics cubes, where where you put your stick actually affects like the pitch or the mm. echo or you know the low pass, high pass. So. Is there analog? Is it analog feedback for your playing of the instruments? The how hard you hit is how loud it is. Uh, I didn't. I don't remember doing that. Uh, I mean, I don't remember sensing that. But I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. That doesn't seem like a difficult thing to do. One thing I wanted from the volumetric effects boxes was a three-dimensional mm. uh, thing because that's something you don't get on like an iPad if you're messing around in GarageBand. It's yeah. just X, Y. But this, you have the potential to do a Z axis as well. And th there's the potential to do more there. They're not currently using the Z axis for much. But uh, that's, that's there uh, for musicians or people who just want to play around in music. And that feels like a, trying to take advantage of VR, the benefits of VR. One, being able to be in a space and yeah. having the volumetric controls. Mm -hmm. And you know, playing an uh, instrument in the real world, it is a volumetric experience. You're strumming in more than just Totally. One, one dimension. But there's also a real world haptic feedback to playing in the real world. Exactly. And that's like, you can, we haven't had a virtual, like a VR keyboard right, that like, plays well. That feels like the simplest of instruments, yeah. but because we don't have precise enough hand controls and haptic feedback, that's going to be tough. So VR music games have really been all about these abstractions. Like, that's why it's a DJ game, because mm -hmm. DJs, it's all about pressing buttons and syncing up controls. And here, it's having that visualized in a virtual space. What, what this demands is an audience. Like this mm. is an experience that you, it's a live music making experience. And what you want when you're doing this is to be leading a party. Like you want to have a dance floor in front of you. And having mm. a bunch of virtual avatars dancing to your beat is not gonna be the same thing as if you could do this live in a virtual reality like Rec Room or yeah. VR Chat or something like that. That's where we want so badly to see like this mix mash of VR experiences. You know, Ready Player One is coming out this weekend. And in the book and maybe in the film, there's a, supposed to be a, a, a dance sequence where yeah. one of the party, characters not uh, was, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Is, is, is DJing. So I'm really curious how that is visualized Me too. in the movie and whether it's something like this. Um, all the demos that we used at the Valve booth were using the Vive Pro, mm -hmm. uh, which lets us know the Vive Pro is coming out pretty soon. You may have seen some impressions and some hands-on online. And so uh, hopefully we'll be able to share more information about the Vive Pro experience in a future episode. So stay tuned for that. Um, but we'll see you until then. Bye.